Hello and welcome to um, this webinar, the fifth uh, webinar in our five webinar series. Um, Sue, I agree with you. I really like uh, Mark's VW Combi in the background as well. I think it's a nice touch. Um, uh, yes, so today we've got myself, John Giles, we've got Mark Hank, and we've got uh, Nathan Ross Adams. Nathan's going to be helping with the question session and um, Mark's going to be adding his wisdom and making sure that I that I say the right things. Um, yeah, so we've got a nice crowd in already and there's still people coming in. And um, just to remind you where we currently are, we have been busy with this five series. And essentially what we're trying to do is to help you to determine what to do now that Popia is here. So we started off with looking at, well, must you comply with it? Then we said, okay, let's get an overview of this law. Then we asked, are you the right person to be responsible for this? And then we looked at what the impact is on different organizations, because depending on the impact, it has a big influence on what your next steps are. And so today, that's exactly what we're doing. We're going to be looking at what your next steps are and guiding you on, on what to do and, and what not to do. And I hope you really find this useful. We've prepared hard for today and it's nice to have a, a good crowd in. All right, so let me, um, unless Mark, would you like to add anything at this stage? Um, no, John, I think, that it's, I, I think that the session is very important uh, as it will give guidance to and add on to or supplement what the information that we've already given you um, John has some great insights on approach, and we also have the advantage of having worked with many clients in different areas. So we know that it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, exercise, and that in different organizations have to approach this differently, and their approaches uh, are not something that we can just put a generic framework around. But uh, I think that we can give you a lot of good advice on what to address, when to address it. Some of the things will take a bit longer than others. Um, and maybe you need to start them earlier and run them in parallel with, with uh, some of the steps that John will be taking you through. These are things, these are decisions that you're all gonna have to make and hopefully we'll give you good guidance in that regard. Thanks, John. Great, Mark. Yeah, and I think the other useful thing is that we assisted many organizations through the GDPR grace period and we learned some good lessons there and hopefully we can pass those on to you and help you to do it better than some organizations did it during that time. All right, let me um, share my screen. And just go to our presentation. Just waiting for it to load. Sometimes it just takes a bit of time to, to go to full screen. So there we are. Okay, great. So we've been jumping around this presentation and it's the presentation we use for all our um, events and all our presenting. And the, the, the reason we use this tree is that it's an analogy that each organization has to grow their own tree. In other words, work out what they need to do, what steps they need to take in order to protect personal information. And we also, we really strongly believe that there's this process that every organization has to go through. You, you can't avoid it. And the steps here are, there's an intro with some background information. Then there's the learning step. And this is about awareness. So really the intro and learning are about awareness. You've got to raise your awareness about the issue then you can plan on what action you're going to take. Then you actually implement that. You protect personal information. You then sustain it. And, and really that's the process that you've got to follow. And so when organizations have asked us over the last eight years, I need a, a checklist, I need a framework, I need a, I need a compliance um, framework or a plan or a, a, a readiness plan. There are lots of different words for it. But essentially, we, we've mapped that out and created that. And that is what our program is. It's the steps that you should take. 
all of them laid out in a, in a sequence that makes sense to guide you through what the next steps are that you, you need to take. So we've, we've spoken a bit about learn, that was the overview. And if we go into plan, this is now we, the beginnings of taking the next steps is going into the plan stage. And so these are the next steps that, that you really need to take if you've got a, a level of awareness around the law. And I want to run through them very quickly. We, we again don't have a huge amount of time today. We've got about 30 minutes and then, and then questions, maybe 40 minutes and then questions. But really what you need to, to do next, and this is so important, is get your governing body on board. And it might be that, that you work in a company and there's one director, one shareholder. But you need to get that person on board. Explain to them why this is important. And, and um, if you're a larger organization and you've got uh, the, the board, or it might be an exco, you really do need to get them on board. It is so important. The second aspect is about getting your governance rights. And we spoke about this in a lot of detail, particularly the role of the information officer. But today I want to introduce you to a governance model which is a, essentially how we see this playing out. Now, this is for a larger organization, but um, it works for smaller organizations as well. So the governance model, we start with the CEO up at the top, and you'll see under each person, there's a, a percentage, which is an indicator of how much effort is involved or work from that particular person is required. And so the CEO has got a very important role, but a small role because they delegate to the information officer who's got a very important role. The information officer might have permanent support that we discussed previously, and also then temporary team members. And those temporary team members include people like project sponsors or program managers, administrators, business analysts, change managers, consultants, external legal and other people other service providers and a number of people. So collectively, the blocks in green have a significant amount of work to do. It's about 65% of the work is what needs to be done by that group of people. So I'll, I'll look at this in a few different ways, but you then have each business area needs to have a champion and each business area is going to have a significant amount of work to do. And we've here said, for argument's sake, each one is about 5%. So IT is going to have 5% of the things to do. Legal is going to have 5%. And then you've got all the other business areas as well. And then for really large organizations, each business area is going to roll out those controls to multiple departments. And collectively in your organization, that is who needs to play a role. And so you can immediately see it really is a team effort. It's going to be many people in your organization. It's not just the information officer who's doing everything. There are lots of people who are going to need to help and to get this right. And then on the left over here, we've got Michelson's, which we are obviously external. And there are two ways in which we can assist your organization. The one is by providing you with a program which is the, the framework, if you like, it's the steps to be taken. And that guides everything that is going to be done and really enables it to happen much quicker and it'll save you a lot of time, particularly that information officer and the role that they have to perform. Then Michelson's, we can do about 15% of the work for you. It's possible that we can. We don't necessarily say we should be doing that 15% for you, but it's possible for us to do that. And then you're going to have multiple other suppliers who are, could do about 25% of it for you. And so they feed into this temporary team members section doing the 45%. And uh, that's really where you would outsource many of the tasks in that layer to Michelson's and to other service providers. So that's a governance model quickly. Um, Mark, I don't know if you've got anything to add to, to that, that slide. I think that the one thing that I would just uh, stress is that when we look at these percentages, obviously they are uh, estimates. And depending, you know, I mean, in an uh, information officer, we're talking about the project and the information officer uh, uh, 
providing 13% of the input into that project, that doesn't mean to say that we are looking for a part-time information officer who uses 13% of his time. What it means is that if you have a large organization, it might mean that that 13% comprises the full day or the, 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 the role of the information officer is a full-time one. Um, and we need to just understand that uh, this is scalable depending on the size of the organization and the type of information that you're processing. Um, and what John has done is try to give an indication of who has to do what in uh, the different roles of dealing with this. Thanks, John. Exactly. We've got we've got well over 200 people on this call and, and really this and, and everything in this presentation is designed to give you an indication. We'll look at some some um, numbers on what the cost could be. And again, it's very much looking at it from a, a generic perspective. But I think, you know, what what I'm trying to give you a picture of here is that there are many role players. There are many people who have to work as a team. Um, Mark and I have presented on this many times and there's some great videos by the ICO explaining how important it is to work as a team. And um, yeah, so that's, that's that model. So that's a key thing to get right. And I think Mark and I have discussed this as well so many times and with the rest of the team in Michelson's. So many people rush ahead to try and do things without getting, getting the governance right first. And it is so important to get that right before you pr uh, proceed. So then the next steps would be to look at whether there's any software that you should be using to assist you. Then it would be to get a common interpretation around the law. Then you need to map your activities. And again, you know, each one of these, we've got a module in the program because it is about a 40 minute presentation about what you should be doing. But really, how can you comply or protect personal data if you don't have a map of your activities or a record of your processing activities? Large organizations are required to have that by law, and you need it anyway, really, to be able to, to comply with the law. This is also a classic issue that's scalable. So smaller businesses can do this manually, and you could do it in, in a few hours. But if you're large organizations, it's a significant exercise. And that's why you would probably also wanting to be looking at software that would help you to achieve that. The next step after that is to do a gap analysis for many organizations. And so you're saying you're, you're, you're working out, um, you're comparing your organization to a regulatory requirement and identifying what gaps there are so that you can then fill those gaps. Then you identify what actions you're going to take to fill the gaps. You then look at some quick wins. So, you know, these, this is a very high level, but for us, these are the next steps you should be taking. So once you've done a gap analysis and identified all your actions, you then out of that list want to identify what some quick wins are. And I'll give you a few examples just now. We'll drill down into a couple. And, um, in the program, we've got developed a module on quick wins, which are quick wins that, that, that apply to many organizations and lots of people find it very useful. Our members, they work through that module and identify which quick wins they should be looking at and then they, they implement those. And then the last one there, sorry, is, is actions to take first. And um, that actions to take first is is really we developed that around the GDPR when many people were chasing a deadline and they didn't have much time. So we really were saying to people, here are some actions you can take first to try and get you as far ahead as possible. And I think many people are gonna be in that boat when they get close to the Papier deadline. We wouldn't suggest you wait until then, rather start now do your quick wins and then do the other actions that are necessary following a risk-based approach. John, uh, while, you, while you're there, I think if you could just um, go back to plan and just uh, highlight that map that we have there. I just want to illustrate what happens. Um, uh, no, no not, the, not the mapping of the activities. There's a map on, on the slide uh, under plan. Um, 
there we go. Uh, your curse is right on it at the moment. Uh, what happens when you don't uh, plan properly and get, get your plans right? Um, you'll see that this is actually a map of Johannesburg uh, C CBD. And uh, what is interesting about the map is if you go along Billion and Goni Street, you'll see that the streets don't, the streets don't actually line up. And this was, uh, in fact, an issue where the planning, the, two pla the, the, the planners of one part of the survey and planners of the other part of the survey for Johannesburg did not coordinate what they were doing correctly. Some of you who are familiar with Johannesburg will know that uh, there was a street, it's now been changed, but there was a street called Error Street. And that came about as a result of this error, the, the name of the street. So in this case, it was quite significant. It uh, had uh, quite an impact on the cost of planning, et cetera, in Johannesburg. Um, and, you know, we, when you look at your own planning, one of the things that I really stress is that, as John has previously said to you, don't rush into it, plan properly, get the right things in place. Uh, before you start just doing certain things. It will be worthwhile if you do that. Thanks, John. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Planning is so, so important to, to do right. All right, so then I thought what we'd quickly do is in our protect step, and we've got um, grouped under each different functionary things that they should do. I thought I'd quickly show you a few of the quick wins. So for example, under IT, there are many things IT should do, but in information security, there are a few quick wins that are really fantastic things to do, like shredding documents, ensuring that you're using encryption correctly, including encrypting all, lap, uh, all, all laptops. And then one of my personal favorites is that you should really be encouraging everyone in your organization to use a password manager, like one password is the one that I use. And essentially password managers enable you to have one password that unlocks a vault that contains all your username and passwords. And what it enables is you is, well, for everyone in your organization to have very strong, unique passwords. And so this is a, a, a quick win that works so nicely. Um, LastPass has a, a free version and many people use LastPass. And really, if you just encourage everyone in your organization to use LastPass, have strong passwords and change them often and they're unique, it's a quick win. It costs you very little and you're gonna make significant strides very quickly. So that's an example of a quick win. And I, 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 I'm a big fan of quick wins, but at the same time, it also doesn't mean you mustn't do all the other important things. There, there are lots of important things that need to be done. All right, so I think let's leave that there. And I think that it might be time for a poll. So let's see, we've got a nice crowd in and, and let's get some interaction going. So I'd be interested to see uh, if you could answer this question, which is, what steps have you already taken? Let's get an idea of, you know, we're talking about next steps, but what have you already done? Uh, if you wouldn't mind choosing one of those answers and let's get an idea of, of where we're at. Great, so we, the, the answers are coming in. So there are quite a few of you that have said you've done nothing here at the beginning. Some of you have raised general awareness but not yet planned what to do. Um, some of you, yeah, have planned um, and you've done a gap analysis and then some of you have, have gone even further. So there, there are very few who have been audited or are sustaining compliance and will get certified later. Um, so that's about, let's leave it there and I'll share the results with you. So <clears> the <throat> 23% are at the beginning and 38%, so by far the, the most significant or greatest percentage have raised some awareness but not yet planned what to do. And about 17% have done a gap analysis, which is really interesting. And I, I think, uh, yeah, that's uh, really worth, worth taking note of. So then, the next question I wanted to ask was, what is your biggest challenge at the moment? And if you wouldn't mind 
ticking, you can tick multiple here. You can choose whichever ones apply to you, but let's start getting a feel for what your biggest challenge are. What's stopping you from taking your next steps? I always can't help think, uh, thinking when I watch people voting like this, imagine if we could vote as a country this way, it would be uh, <laughs> incredibly more efficient. Thanks, Chief, as the votes are flying in. And uh, let me give you a little bit more time, but at the moment, I'll share the results with you in a minute, but really it's looking quite balanced, which is interesting. There are no real clear winners, although it does seem to be both where to start and a lack of resources that seem to be winning. So let's end the poll there and I'll share the results with you. Yeah, so compliance fatigue is pretty high up and I definitely agree with that. The, 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 we, we've got to be very careful in our next steps because often the business is already sick and tired of compliance. And if you bring in another issue, it uh, really can um, cause a lot of frustration. And also obviously we're in tough times and many businesses and people are really just trying to keep going. So you want to be very careful in how you bring this issue into the organization. And the key thing is not to waste people's time. What you do must be, must be clever. It must be specific to the organization. If you try and um, go overboard with this, you'll get pushback. And we have um, been involved in some projects or spoken to people who've really had problems with this where the business just pushes back and says, no, we're not tackling this. Some of you have got budget constraints. Some of you have got too much information. I, I, I hear you on that. There's a barrage of information at the moment that's coming through. And really that's one of the things that we try and help you with is to, we're almost your filter. We look at that information and then we try and let you know of the important things. So only send you alerts that you need to know about, not everything you need to know about. And that's really a role we want to play is try and help filter for you so that you only get the information and, and the information you need. Then a lot of you, so the winner is we don't know where to start. And um, that is a, a good point. And um, yeah, I'll talk about it a bit more, but that's essentially our program. We've, we've, we've given you where to start and you can work through the different steps. Skip across a bit more if, you, if you're happy you've done things and go to the key places where it makes sense for you. And then quite a few of you, yes. If I may come in there, one of the things um, uh, specifically around compliance fatigue, uh, certainly where I've been able to assist clients relating to compliance fatigue is just being able to show the benefits. And there are lots and lots of examples within organizations and outside of organizations um, in dealing with the, the what we've got to do for data protection. Uh, the benefits are... There are a myriad of other benefits. One of the things that we, what has happened simply as we've progressed from paper-based uh, business into um, electronic business uh, and the way that we deal with information in our businesses is that we haven't really dealt with the information governance issues very well, typically in, in organizations. And I think that it is a, an important thing that if you can show that it, this is not just about complying, but that there are huge benefits to the organization. And in, for the successful organizations, they, they're going to be distinct competitive advantages. We've seen that playing out in all sorts of jurisdictions, um, uh, predominantly the, the, the EU and, and uh, in the USA. But I think it is an important aspect of how you actually champion and deal with this, is to get beyond just this is a compliance issue and get into that it is very good for the business as well. Thanks, John. Thanks, Mark. Yes, I, I agree with that. All right, let's have a look at... Uh, yeah, let's leave that, that there for now in terms of polls. All right, so let's then go up to next step at the top here and let's talk a little bit more about next steps and, and options available to you. So um, one of the things we like saying is that data protection is like personal fitness. You always want to be fitter, but you're never 100% fit. 
Another key point is that you have to do a lot of the running. We've mentioned this a few times, but nobody can get fit for you. Somebody can give you a program, can help you to get fitter, but they can't actually do the running for you. And so we've got this diagram of two people running together. And uh, this is really the role we want to play is to help you get fitter and sometimes do the running for you. The other thought here is that our point is don't, don't try and run alone. Um, some people will try with information off the internet to sort this issue out themselves. It really is a complex issue and it's taken us many, many years to, to get our heads around it and to develop um, various tools and be able to filter through the noise. And I really don't recommend, even no matter how small you are, trying to do this alone is a recipe for disaster. So, um, yeah, so then there are two real options in which we help people. The one is that we offer data protection programs and you're able to join our program. And the other way is that you consult with a specialist. So you engage with us and we can then do some of the running for you. So let's drill down first into joining our program and talking a little bit about, about the program. So the program, it, they, they run month to month, so you can join them and leave at any point, which is very comforting for many people. It means you can stay for as long as you want, and as long as you're receiving value, you stay in the program. Um, and if you're not, you can leave. Then the other key thing is that it's, a, it's an enterprise subscription. So it's for an unlimited number of named users in your enterprise. And this is very important because if we looked at that governance model, there are lots of people who are going to play a role and you might at different times want different people to get access to the program to look at different modules. So then let's drill down into here, into the, into the program. So we've essentially got three core programs. There's one for large organizations, which we define as being more than 250 employees. And the cost there is about five and a half thousand rand a month. We then have the one for medium sized and that's between 250 and 50 employees and that's 3,850. And then we've got small business is fewer than 50 employees and that's 1,850 rand a month. Now, the reason we've picked these, these key milestones is that many organizations with less than 50 employees are exempt from certain things and they need to be looking at it through that lens of a small business. What are the core things that I need to do? The medium size, again, between 50 and 250, under 250, you're exempt from a few things and there's some considerations there. And then for large organizations, there are other considerations. And really these three programs, the core material is the same, the modules are the same, but each one gives you the ability to look at it from the perspective of one of these organizations. Because as we discussed, this issue is very scalable and it depends on the impact on you and who you are, which is why you need different ways of looking at this content. So we've got those three different core programs and those are the costs that are involved and those do include that. Then we said, okay, but we actually need to look at this in a bit more focus because what happens if you're in the healthcare industry? Or what happens if you are um, a school? Or if you are a community scheme? Or you're a processor or an operator? Then again, you need to be looking through a particular lens to give you focus on this material so that it's particularly relevant to you and, and you're able to work through it and, and in a way that makes sense to you. So we've developed various lenses which are included in the program. They're part of the subscription, so they're not extra and you get those lenses automatically. We will be developing further lenses as we go. And so if there aren't lenses currently that suit you, they, they will be coming. And uh, obviously the more people that join for, that require a certain lens, we'll then develop it. Yeah, so those are, that's how the lenses work. You can watch a live video. Sorry, Mark. John, John, if I may come in, uh, a significant number of people mentioned uh, that, the info, that there was too much information. And uh, I take very little credit for it because I've done very little on, in the program itself, but John and the attorneys that have worked on it over the years 
um, have done an enviable job in essentially sifting out what is important to you. Uh, and I think that that's very important when, uh, for those people that are battling to, to, what, to get the information necessary and to digest that. Um, and the other thing that I think is important is that the, it's, it's been dealt with from the point of view of a number of years, or certainly many, many years of cumulative experience of uh, attorneys who are well-versed in data protection in actually drilling down as to what is important in different organizations from their experience and just simply from their knowledge of how things are being dealt with and how regulators around the world are also dealing with uh, various issues. So for those of you that are battling with too much information, this is a, an answer to be able to get to the correct information um, and to be able to trust that information because it has been very carefully thought through. Uh, a lot of effort has been done even in, in those lenses where there's additional information to source the best information um, and to actually uh, work out what is the information that is going to help our clients the best. Thanks, John. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, and I've, I've just come across here to our website. And if you go to join program in the top of the, the website, you can then read more about the programs there and the, the different lenses that are included. And then also while Mark was talking, I thought I'd, I'd show you the, the back end of the, the program. So once you've logged into the members area, the, the branding changes slightly and then it goes gray. And this is when people realize this, they're quite amazed is that the public part of the, the website is red, the privates or the members area is gray. And there's more information in the, in the members area than there is on the public side of the website. And if you know, if you spend some time on our website, you'll know how much information is on the public side. So really the golden nuggets are in the members area and the members area is denoted by the gray um, branding at the top. And so maybe to show you plan protect and you're able to do things like um, you can search for for different things so we could search for um, a gap analysis for example and you'll quickly see there's the module talking about doing a gap analysis and let me show you really how how a module works a module has an introduction it then has some outcomes that we're seeking to achieve we then have the written content of that module, which goes into the subject matter of what we're tackling. In this case, it's the, the gap analysis. We include things like top tips, and then there are useful resources in each module. As Mark was saying, we go and look for the best resources on the internet and give you links to them. But we've also developed and, and created many of them ourselves. And then there's an action items list for each module. So it helps you to, 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 and this is really the checklist for each module. And so collectively they make up a checklist for you to follow. And then we've got a recording of the video for that module, which is between about 30 minutes and about 45 minutes and you can watch that video. So that's really what it looks like. The last thing to show you here is that on the program page, you can click here on join which then takes you to the program registration page and you can fill in your details and choose which program you want, which lenses that you would like to have access to and then submit and we'll then get in touch with you with, a, with an invoice and help you to get into the program. So let's go back to the presentation and I think we've covered everything that I wanted to cover there. One other thing to mention is that we do have a brochure for our program and that's quite useful. You can download it and you can provide it to decision makers to help them to explain what this is, what the costs are and to get by and to join the program. Um, yeah, it is quite a difficult thing to explain and that's one of the challenges that you might have and that's what the brochure is intended to do is to, to help you do that. So the other question a lot of people ask is, well, how long am I going to be in this program for? How long will it take me to do what I need to do? 
And the answer here is that it really depends on a number of factors. If you're a small organization and you really want to focus on this issue, you probably in a couple of months could work through our program and do what, you've, what you need to do. But for most people, it takes a bit longer. And uh, particularly for medium-sized organizations, you're probably looking at between six and 12 months of having to be in the program. And for large organizations, you're probably going to need at least 12 months up until the popular deadline to be in the program. And uh, particularly as we get closer to the deadline and then after the deadline, we want to play a role of assisting members and, and assisting a large group of people collectively get this right. And, and, uh, and that's what we're hoping to do. So almost think of it, we're sort of picturing that we're hoping that we will have um, hundreds of people running a marathon with us. We'll be the coach, we'll be helping everyone get fit, sometimes doing some of the running for people. And really the, the, the finish line is the popular deadline. And then after that, we'll be dealing with various issues, but, but that's where we're headed and that's what we're trying to, to get to. All right, so then the other option is that you can consult with a specialist. And so for some people, they don't want to be in a program. They want to consult with a specialist and outsource as much as possible to other people. And so here, we, we certainly can help. And this is where we do the running for you. So nobody likes doing the 100 meter hurdles. It's one of those races that you need to be very tall and very strong for and a specialist in specifically running the 100 meter hurdles. And so this is where we can do the running for you. And you might decide that you're in the program and you look at a, a particular issue and you think, okay, I can do A, B, and C, but I really need someone to do, do other things for me. And this is where we come in and we can do about 15% of the things, just to give you an indication. We can't do everything for you. Nobody can do everything for you, but we can do some of the things for you. And really, if you go through our um, program and look at the different steps, we can help all the way along. And so we've assisted in, in all these areas from briefing the governing body, doing lots of board briefings. We can also help raise awareness in your organization through private workshops, online workshops. We've, we've done literally hundreds of, of workshops helping organizations to raise awareness in them. We can also map your activities. We can do a gap analysis for you. We can update your policies and procedures, and we can also work with your contracts. We've done literally hundreds of data processing agree agreements or addendums. And those are just some examples. There, there are many other things that we can help you with. Um, and again, there's more information on our website about what those, those things are. Maybe if I quickly jump across here, on our website, there's this page about data protection solutions we offer. And um, Nathan, maybe you can drop some links into the chat box to help people direct them to this, but you'll also get an email after today's session helping direct you to different material on our website. Um, so in terms of these solutions, there is this page where you can inquire about um, getting help from us and give us as much information as possible about what you'd like us to do. And we can then engage with you to help scope that and price it and then tackle that for you. So that would be the, the place to go for that. All right, so then one of the most often asked questions that we get is around cost. And people saying to us, can you give me a quote to make me poppy compliant? What is this going to cost me? Um, both in terms of what Michelson's might charge, but also generally speaking, what the cost's going to be. If, you've, if, you, if you think of that governance model, both internally and externally. So there, there are quite a few points here that I wanted to make, but the one key one is this, the saying that if you think compliance is expensive, try non-compliance. And I think this is so true. Many organizations have learned the hard way if you have a data breach and you don't deal with it correctly, it can be a very, very costly experience, like with Uber, with um, their breach that they had. And so really being proactive here definitely save costs. 
So an interesting thing to think about here is we, we did a lot of research about costs and the Financial Times has a really interesting article talking about what it costs listed companies to comply with the GDPR. And the astonishing number that they got to after a significant survey that they had done is that it cost on average 15 million US dollars for each listed entity to comply with data protection. Well, that's a really big number and, uh, and, and those are large organizations. But you know, if you take organizations like a Microsoft or a Google, it's closer to the billion dollar mark is what they've spent, or Facebook. It's, 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 a, it's a radical number. But um, let's then look at it in the context of South Africa and try and give you some indicators of numbers. And again, this is very much just indicators. But the learn step is about 20 to 100K if, if somebody was gonna do it for you. So, for example, if Michelson's, if we're doing a um, awareness workshop for you, it's a private one, it'll be online, it's from about 20,000, and then it depends on how many you want to do and with how many audiences. Then from a planning perspective, we've roughly said it's about 250 to 450,000. That would be for um, gap analysis work and also to brief governing bodies and to, to look at those steps as part of planning, a, a rough figure. Then I think where a lot of people make a mistake is that they spend a lot of their budget on planning and not enough on actually protecting personal information because that's what we've actually got to do. And this is where there's a lot of unknown because it's only through doing a gap analysis that you can establish where your gaps are to know then what action you've got to take and then what the cost is associated with that. And so it's very hard to get a full picture of the cost until you've done a gap analysis, until you've done your planning properly. But don't make the mistake of blowing all your budget on the planning and don't spend it on actually doing things. And so here we said it's between um, one and 500 million. And so this is for larger organizations. Um, but I, I have heard of a listed company in South Africa that's budgeting 500 million for, for data protection. But I think most of us will be in the much lower ranges than that and not nearly at that number. And then remember that this, is, this issue is never going to end. And so we've said it's about 50 to 250,000 to be audited at the end if that's what you're wanting and to get certified. And then there'll be a monthly fee after that. So there's always gonna be um, a cost in ensuring that you sustain compliance, you're monitoring the law, you're monitoring changes, interacting with the regulator, dealing with incidents, it's gonna continue on an ongoing basis. So those are really just, uh, you know, the, the uh, thumb stuck numbers, but it's to give you an indication and it's, it's, a, it's ready to try and show you that this is a costly business. If you want somebody to do as much as they can for you, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. And really this is why we developed the program because we want you to do as much yourselves as possible and you will dramatically reduce your costs if you are doing as much of it you can yourself. So I'd like to well, launch- if, if I may come in there, I think that the one proviso that I have to what John has just said is that um, if, you try and do all of this without some background and without some help. It, it may be that within your organization, you have the right resources. That's, that's wonderful. But if you don't have the right resources, you are going to waste a lot of money within your organization uh, in, in attempting to do things that you don't have the expertise for. But our goal uh, really in what we are trying to do is to make sure and maybe a, a mechanism of, of determining uh, our value to you is how quickly we work ourselves out of a job. How quickly do we provide you or transfer the skills that are necessary for you to be able to do these things yourselves? I think that is a critical element of this. It's, you know, data protection is not going to go away. Anybody that has any knowledge of data protection sees that it is in our digital age becoming a more and more important thing for every business. And I think that the importance of creating the, the core competency uh, is a critical uh, consideration in how you deal with it. But the point is, ultimately, consultants 
can help you, they can't do it for you. And you're near going to need to address how you actually put that into, into place. Thanks, John. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, that's valuable points. And I think here yeah, what I'd like to do is also just run a poll to ask what your budget is. And uh, this is obviously anonymous. We won't we we won't know or share it with anyone. But I think it's a it's a good indicator to see roughly what people's budgets are for data protection. So I'll give you a bit of time to to answer that. Yeah, you know, the, the, the other key point here is that, as we've been saying, data protection is scalable, and it depends on what budget you've got. If you, it's a bit like, um, you know, fitness is on a scale of very unfit to very fit, but you're never 100% fit. And you, you can be fitter or, or less fit, depending on how much time you've got to exercise. It's a similar scenario here of saying, well, what, what do we have available to us? What are we able to do with the budget that's available to us? So let's end that there. And it's, it's really interesting in terms of the results. We've got quite an even spread, but they're sure 26% of you say that you've got nothing. And that's a, that's a really tough place to be in order to tackle this issue and do what you need to do with no budget is, is going to be really tough. Um, but then we spread over quite a broad spectrum there. Um, interestingly, many people are about five to 25 or 25 to hundred in that middle range. And uh, that makes makes a lot of sense. Okay, let's leave that there. And then the one other um, poll that I was keen to to look at is to get an idea of capacity. Mark was talking about capacity now, and let's see how much capacity do you have to work on this. And I'd be interested in in uh, in your views on 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 this. So obviously, if you have no capacity, as we've been saying, you need to build a core competency within your organization. If you just don't have the people that, that are able to do it, then you may well have to recruit somebody. And that's where the, the information officer job description could come in handy, or it's to recruit people to assist that information officer. But um, you really do need to have some capacity internally. As we've said, you can't outsource all of this to somebody. And so it might well be that you need to be looking at increasing and building capacity in your organization. And if we share the, those results, um, yeah, so very few people have capacity in everything that they need. Um, others have capacity, but they need guidance. So most of you are in that bracket. And that's I'm very pleased to see that because that's exactly what our program is intended to do. It's to give you that guidance that you need. And then we're here to help you if you need us but really, hopefully, the program will give you as much information and tools and, and, and what you need to do most of it yourselves. So if you've got no capacity, you are going to have to either get capacity or outsource it to other people. All right, let me go uh, back to... Back to the presentation. And we go out of that. All right, so then looking at, as part of, of if you're engaging us as a, a consultant, the fees we charge, we, we really like to make sure that you're in control when it comes to fees. And so we prefer fixed price quotes. Ideally, it would be for you to give us a very clear scope on what needs to be done, and we can give you a fixed price here. And um, the problem, though, is that often we get asked to do things where there isn't a defined scope. And a gap analysis is a classic example. There are many different types of a gap analysis. And we really need to know in detail which one and, and what you want us to do in order to give you a fixed price quote. So if we can't do a fixed price, which is our, our preference, we then we can work on a time and materials basis. And then we can also work on a retainer basis. We do have a retainer with multiple clients and we call it a data protection as a service. It's where we work with you on a monthly basis to take various action to um, implement the necessary controls. It includes us attending meetings, making decisions about what to do and not do, 
And um, that's the, the third option there. So we've spoken about inquiring. You can inquire on our websites if you'd like us to help you with any aspect and we'll engage with you further in, in that regard. So I think let's run another poll here and I'd like to ask you um, this question of, have you been able to identify which you think is your, your best next step? And, and uh, you know, while you're voting on that, what, um, what I like to say is that these aren't alternatives. So you can join the program and then you can consult with a specialist if you need us. And you'll be in such a better position to consult with a specialist if you've part of the program because you'll be coming from a place of knowledge. You'll know the questions to ask. You'll be able to give us an accurate scope. And, uh, and it, it, for that reason, it'll make life a lot easier. So it's not an either or situation. So I think um, I'll give you a little bit more time to, to vote. So the other point being is that if you're not sure which one to go with, really you should be joining a program because through working through the program, you'll identify what you can do, what can be done internally and what you're gonna to want to outsource. And so the program itself will help you in determining your next steps that you're wanting to take. So if we end that poll and I share the results with you, we've got, so 27% would like to join a program, 11% would like to consult with a specialist, 45 would like a combination of the above, which is what I was expecting. And about 17% of you don't know or not sure. So for those of you who don't know, I, as I said, I think joining a program makes a lot of sense. The other alternative of what you could do is you could do an uh, organizational impact assessment. So this is essentially what we did in the previous webinar. You could either watch that webinar and get a better idea of your impact, or you can uh, complete the questionnaire on our website for an organizational impact assessment. And we can set up a call to discuss with you what your next steps are and, and go into more detail about these different options. And then I think the last thing before we get to some questions is just uh, to say that we really believe food feedback is the food of champions. And we really would appreciate it if you could give us feedback on the webinars that you've attended. You could do it now in the chat box or you can drop us a mail or um, yeah, any way of giving us feedback. We'd really appreciate any feedback on the series of webinars that we've been doing. Great, so shall we go to some questions? And um, Nathan, I don't know if you've managed to um, identify some themes of the questions. I can see we've got a lot of questions that have come in and there's been a lot of activity in the chat box. Um, yeah, Nathan, any themes? Hi, Hi yes, John. Um, so the predominant themes are um, relating to, uh, well, general popular questions. Um, then there are some questions about uh, compliance software that could be used. Um, and then the last set of questions relate to the program. So I'll just I'll move uh, in the, across those themes. Um, the, gen the general pop here um, questions relate to um, whether, if there are other laws that um, a company need to comply with, for example, FICA or the NCA um, that require these companies to process personal information. Um, in, in that instance, do companies still need consent from their clients to process that personal information? Mm. So in other words, if, um, if the law requires an organization to process personal information, then do they need consent? So, so you, the way to look at it is that in order to process personal information, you need a lawful ground for processing. And there are seven of them. One of them is that I have consent Another is that I am required by law to process that information. So in that scenario, you wouldn't need consent and you could rely on the fact that FICA obliges me to do so. But remember, that's just one of the principles of data protection. You then still have to check that you're complying with those other principles. Thanks, John. Um, then the next question relates to the information officer specifically. Um, the the Data protection law for, for many of the, uh, the participants, um, I, I think they've realized that it's, it's a, a journey and not a, a destination. It's not a checkbox exercise. 
Um, and so there seems to be a general um, question related to whether companies do need to have a, a, a information officer role where they hire someone outside uh, of the company to come in um, and perform this role um, or whether it's better for them to skill up someone within the company. So it's, that's the general question. Mm. No, I think um, the, the, it depends on the impacts, obviously, but for many organizations, you'll be able to identify somebody and it'll be a, 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 a half a day, um, a month role. And so you don't need to hire somebody, you can skill up somebody, and that's obviously the purpose of the program. And um, they should be able to tackle it. But if you have a bigger impact or a larger organization, the role is going to become significant and you might end up being that it's a full-time role, in which case you would need to hire somebody. And so for the, the small or medium-sized organizations out there, if this is a major issue, it might be the time to start considering somebody who can perform multiple roles like deal with data protection, but also deal with compliance with other laws, maybe health and safety laws. And um, um, yeah, so you know, there, there, there are the, the role of the information officer is going to become a profession and there'll be thousands of information officers in South Africa because it, they're going to be required and they'll be necessary. Thanks, John. Um, then moving along to the theme of compliance software, um, I see these questions, are, uh, the questions have come through at least related to whether, um, company, uh, whether we could suggest any um, compliance software that companies could use um, to help them in their data protection journey. Um, and um, just specifying whether this, the compliance software would be a tool to data protection or whether it could actually just govern the entire process. Mm. So it would be a tool. I don't think it can govern the whole process. And um, really, so we, we've got our module in the program which talks about data protection software. And we're aware of about 30 different vendors of software that may be useful. And um, we, in that module, we go into quite a lot of detail of comparing them, talking about what they are, sending links, to, uh, providing links to the different tools. But I must say, if I had to um, highlight two in, in this very short space of time, the one is the Microsoft Compliance Manager. It's, uh, and the reason I mention it is that, that Microsoft has spent a huge amount of money on it. And most people have a Microsoft subscription, which actually includes the Compliance Manager for free. And so there's no extra cost there. And so it's a good place to start to have a look at that. And then the other one to mention is TrustArc. We've um, had a really good look at TrustArc and we use TrustArc and we've used it for clients and it is a, a very good system. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, that also I think, but, but it comes at a price, but it is particularly for larger organizations. And I think this is the point is that for large organizations, it's almost impossible to get this right without using software. You can try with spreadsheets, um, but without it, you really are struggling. And then the other key point is that there's software that helps you to, to, to do certain aspects, but we're not really talking about project management software. You know, there, you can use tools like Trello or um, a variety of other project management tools that would help you through the process, but we're more talking about software that actually helps you with privacy management or protecting personal information. Thanks, John. Um, then we have a question about um, historical archives because um, some, some of the businesses have mentioned that they, um, when they think about data protection, they think of it within the digital context. But what about um, historical filing cabinets with um, personal information of previous employees, financial information? Is that something that falls within the scope of data protection and also how um, they can manage and deal with that? these physical copies? Yes, definitely. It's personal information in any format. And so it applies to physical records and, and uh, physical records, often people forget about them, but they're very important. And, and, you know, some really basic things of just locking them in filing cabinets, locking the room, who has access to the key? Are you shredding physical documents? There, there are many very simple quick wins that can apply in that scenario, but it, it certainly does, does apply. Okay. Thanks. And then um, 
what is the relationship between data protection and um, information security? Um, is that part of the same plan that an organization needs to have in place? Um, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, Mark has been ripping me off and that I love Venn diagrams. <laughs> if, if you had a, a big Venn diagram, which is data protection, then privacy is, a, I mean, sorry, information security is a smaller component of that. And there's an overlap, but also there's extra in information security. I don't have a, I don't have a Venn diagram for that. <laughs> I need to make one. But, but um, certainly they, they, uh, data protection is a much bigger issue than information security. Information security is one of the principles um, of data protection. And, um, you know, information security also relates not just to personal information, but to commercially sensitive information. So there are also many components of information security that are not related as well. Um, then we have a, a question that relates to specifically uh, to information security as well, but whether um, the, the standards of security that companies currently have in place, for example, for um, when it comes to email encryption, sending of invoices, um, is there a specific objective standard that they need to follow now um, when it comes to personal information? Mark, do you want to take these questions? I think you're probably better placed. Um, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that, and John is quite correct, that the organizational and security measures that we, uh, that we need to put into place, those are typically information security measures. Uh, Section 19 specifically provides that we've got to do that. Um, and one of the things, one of the questions that I've, I've, I've often addressed is how did information security arise? Well, information security arose as a result of data protection legislation where the question was, well, what is reasonable security? A question that is incorporated in what you've just said, uh, Nathan. Um, and the point is that we then started developing standards uh, to be able to give people guidance as to what information security would be appropriate in different circumstances. And we now have volumes of standards uh, that deal all, with all sorts of different aspects of information security. Um, one of the things that may be valuable for, for people who wish to look at standard is, is to look at the ISO series, the ISO 27000 uh, series. There's a recent standard that was published late last year, which puts into place uh, or, or puts into uh, or overlaps information security and protection of personal information um, by the, the standard is actually ISO 27701, and it refers specifically to the overlap between existing information security standards, ISO 27001 and ISO 27002, which provide how you put into place an information security management system and the controls that you need. So that more recent standard actually provides for what is called a privacy information uh, security, uh, sorry, a privacy information management system uh, in so far as that standard is, con is concerned. Uh, those are valuable to look at, uh, but please be aware, as John has said, they don't give all of the answers to data protection. They give you mechanisms and guidelines as to how you should go about the organizational and technological measures that you might need to, to have in place to protect information and, you know, we, the, the, the names of the, uh, of the legislation, data, general data protection regulation, protection of personal information act, tell us that we've got to protect it. It's a very important aspect of it, but it is not solely what we've got to do relating to data protection. Thanks, Mark, that's very useful. I think, um, Nathan, I'm just looking at the time here. We, we're just past the hour mark. Um, and I'm happy to continue with questions and, and please stick around for as long as you'd like to, to ask questions and have the discussion. But Nathan, maybe we can focus first on the questions that relate to the program and more specifically to this um, session we've had, and then we can tackle some of the other questions. Okay, definitely. Um, relating to the program specifically, um, one of the questions that has come through is, um, whether there's any uh, time limit or rush for um, for the programs or whether um, a business can work through it at its own pace, basically. 
Mm. Yeah, so you can you can work through at your own pace. The the whole program is there and and everything's there. We we are planning to do lots of live workshops from time to time as part of the program. And so we will be working collectively as a group, but you will be able to go ahead if you want to or slow down if you want to as well because people will be working at different paces. But really, we're all on the same timeline, which is we're all headed for 1 July 2021, and that's our deadline. But um, as we've discussed, it's different for different organizations. So some are going to rush ahead. And if you can get ahead and finish what you've got to do in two months and leave the program, that's absolutely fine. Um, we don't want to, um, uh, you know, I think a lot of people think of an exercise program and they think, well, I'm going to be the person at the end, at the back running trying to keep up with everyone all the time and uh we're very conscious of that we also don't want the person who's at the front running really fast to feel that they have to wait for everybody else so we're trying to cater for all scenarios and i think we do do that um as we we have at the moment okay perfect um and then coming to the um the program in general and the content of the program will the program help companies comply with other uh, data protection legislation like the GDPR, for example. Yes, so we, we um, what we've tried to do, the whole program is centered around the common 80% between data protection laws. And we made this decision really early on. So it's not a poppy program, it's a data protection program because we want to help you comply with South Africa's laws, but also the GDPR or Brazil's or India's or Australia or the UK. It really, the idea is, and, and, and luckily, the laws are very similar across different jurisdictions, so it is possible to do this. And that's what we've set out to do. So the program should help you with the common 80%, and then you can tackle the extra 20%. And, and this is where we are have developed a lens for Papier and plan to develop lenses for other countries. So there'll be the lens for India, for example, and you can then focus on that extra 20% for India or um, whichever country it is at the time that you want to. Perfect. Thanks, John. Um, so, so beyond the, the, the date of, of next year, um, the 1st of July, um, will, what happens beyond then? Do, do companies, could companies stay as part, uh, part of the program um, to, to continue the data protection journey? Um, and will the program be updated in case the laws change? Yes, so, so the program, we're continually updating it. And that is, that is one of the reasons we opted for an online program and not a book, for example, is that an online program can be updated all the time. And that's exactly what we do. The, we've got a, a team of, of 15 attorneys who are continually working at making it better, developing better templates, developing better lenses, and, and that's exactly what we're going to do. And then past the deadline, yeah, the program will continue because what will happen is that, let's say there's a new judgment or a new ruling by the regulator or a new guideline that gets published. The question will be, well, who does this impact and what do you need to change based on that? And that's, again, the role that we'd like to perform is to try and help lots of people wrap their heads around what something is. And by helping lots of people, so we, we got many members, we we're able to, at a, at a vastly reduced cost, help a lot of people. And, uh, and, and for us, uh, you know, that's why we say that um, a, a problem shared is a problem solved. And there's so many things in data protection that we can do together, even if we are competing organizations in the, in the, in the, in the program. There's so many things you can do together that doesn't give you a competitive advantage. It's not something that, that, uh, that is going to give you a head start over somebody else. Sure, there might, be, there might be aspects where there's competition, but then you tackle that outside of the program. The program is for the common compliance requirement that most organizations are experiencing. If there are things that are specific or tailor-made for organizations, you deal with that outside of the program by consulting with a specialist like us. I'd also like to just add to that, Nathan, and that is that um, the, 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 one of the things about data protection law is the law itself is very dynamic. 
because what we are seeing is obviously we are living in a very, very dynamic time where we are using different technologies. The technologies themselves are suddenly being used for different things. Uh, if we just think about the, the fact that probably, um, well, let's say 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, well, it wouldn't have been, there would be no point in saying Facebook because there wasn't a Facebook. And in that very short period of time, uh, Facebook is now used by one seventh of the world's population. And that in itself has had very, very important and significant ramifications, um, which have, well, is pushing the lawmakers to take a look at a different view of very uh, important things that we are seeing in our digital world. So from that perspective, it's not just the law and how we protect information, it's how that how we are evolving to use the, the digital technologies and information that we have in different ways. So what we've already seen with GDPR implementing and being ready for the commencement date is only part of the, what happens. Those organizations need to sustain it and ensure that through uh, their processing of information after that, that they can comply, not just with the law, but with good business practice and protections that they need. That I think is the value of data protection itself. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, oh, John, do you want to share something? Yes, I just thought I'd share. I saw there was a comment there asking about how much the, the program costs. And I just mm -hmm. would direct you back to this page. This is uh, the page on our website. It's called uh, um, Programs or, or Get With The Program. And there are the details of the different programs and the costs associated. So it's about five and a half for large, three eights for uh, medium, and one eight for small. Back to you, Nathan. Okay, and then um, early on on the poll, you mentioned that um, uh, businesses could either choose a combination of uh, consulting with a specialist and joining the program, or either or. But once, once a business has chosen a specific option, like for example, joining a program, that doesn't prevent them from speaking to a specialist later on and um, also getting specific opinions on um, uh, personal information within their business. Yeah, definitely doesn't preclude them from, from switching. So for example, you could join the program and then say, well, I also wanna consult with a specialist on a few issues and that's mm -hmm. perfectly great. Or you could say, I'm in the program, I'm not making progress in the program either because I don't have any internal capacity or I, I just can't get get going. Um, you could then stop the program and then consult with a specialist. So really there's any option that's available and we've intentionally made it very flexible because we, and as Mark says, these are, are difficult changing times. Data protection is principle based. Organizations are, are, many of them are in a process of change themselves. And so we don't want to tie you into contracts or into, into things that you can't change. We, we want to add value to you <clears throat> and do it in a way that enables you to, to, to get what you need. And uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, then just coming along to some more general questions relating to the program. Um, will the program through the different lenses uh, be focused more on higher level information for the strategists within companies or um, will there be granular detail as well that um, uh, people in operations could work on? You know, the program, a key point here is that the program is not training material. It's not, it's not designed to create a level of awareness amongst everyone in the organization, particularly at an operational level. The program really is for decision makers. It's for the, the people who are making decisions about what controls will be in place and putting those controls in place. But the program is very granular. I mean, in total, there is about 50 hours worth of recorded webinars. There, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's about 45 modules that are in the program. So it is a very granular, detailed program, um, but it is, it's, it's, it's not general awareness training. And in fact, there's a module in the program talking about general awareness training to help you to, to implement uh, an awareness training program within the organization. Okay, perfect. That's it from me, John. Um, 
Perfect. Thanks very much, Nathan. That's great. So it's really nice to summarize. So we, you know, we're an hour and 15 minutes in. I can see there, there are a few other specific questions. Um, and I see that in the chat box, we've been there, there are some links that, that Nathan shared, I've shared a few and we've tried to direct you. Um, let me just see if there are any questions here that we could um, pick up on um, quickly. Uh, any, any more? So really for those of you that are here, you're welcome to stay or you could leave us if you want. Um, I think let's just see if there are a few other questions that are available. Um, but you will be getting uh, some, some emails from us with some next steps and some links to different um, material. And, uh, and yeah, thank you very much for attending. We really appreciate it. And as I said, I really appreciate any feedback. So you could um, pop some feedback in the chat box or um, uh, you can send us an email. Um, I really appreciate any feedback that you can give us. So let's have a look and see if there are any other key questions here. Um, do you have to register the information officer with the authority? Yes, you, you do at a point in time. Um, uh, uh, there's a question here around keeping information within South Africa. Um, it's a detailed answer, but essentially you can transfer personal data to other jurisdictions provided there's adequate protection in place. And often a company like Microsoft, their servers are in countries that provide adequate protection. So that shouldn't be a problem. Um, the questions around consent, uh, unfortunately, that's a, a detailed discussion about what consent needs to look like. It is defined in the act and it's quite a long discussion, I'm afraid. Um, Uh, there's questions around the exemptions and what is personal information. I think we tackled that in the overview. And so I think that's the, is that the second, you know, I'm pretty sure that's the second webinar. Um, you can watch these webinars again. They are available on our website. Here is the link that I'll give you through to those um, ones there. There's a question here around COVID, which is interesting. May an employer name an employee who tested positive for COVID-19 or is that confidential? And yeah, so what you should do is don't name the person. You can say that somebody in sales tested positive for COVID-19, but really try and avoid giving their specific name because then they remain anonymous or it's de-identified essentially. It's not then personal. And it's a good example of, of you don't need to make it personal. And so you don't need to say who specifically it is. John, John there is a question relating to retention of, of um, information. Um, and in that instance, if the law requires that you retain information, even though the data subject may wish you to delete it, you're still obliged to keep that information because the law requires it. That is the justification. Um, and if I may say, and I was one of the, the, the people that was responsible for drafting the Act, I think a mistake that we made was that in Section 11, we refer to consent, justification, and objection. And that has led people to believe that the, the legislation is consent-driven, or many people to believe that it's consent-driven. Consent is just one of the justifications. And obviously, there are, if you, if you are lawfully retaining information, uh, and you're required to do so by law, um, the fact that the, the, the data subject suggests that you might uh, delete that information, it's not for them to say so. You are keeping the information in terms of law. Uh, obviously, those rights must be carefully observed, the data subject's rights, but that is the answer to the question that, that, that you've posed. Great. Um, there's another question here also asking about um, uh, small businesses and how much time is needed. And, and I think um, you know, it's, a, it's a good question because you could, as a small business, particularly if you've got a low impact, you could join our program for a month. You could spend um, some time and I would say you, 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 know, you probably would want in that month to set aside probably a day, a week, 
Um, and, but I, I know you're busy and I know you've got a lot to do, so maybe less than that. But um, you could then work through the program and really try and identify the key 10 things that you need to do as a small business. Do those things and you could leave the program. So that's entirely possible, um, particularly if the impact is low. If you're a small business, but you process lots of personal data, impact's gonna be higher, it's gonna take you longer. And I think that's also what we tried to do with the program is cater for different size organizations with different impacts so that you can stay longer or shorter and you almost then have control over what you spend on the issue, depending on the resources that are available to you and how important the issue is to you. I think that maybe we should leave it there. Um, I'm sorry, there are some questions that we haven't got to, but we, we are an hour and 20 minutes in. And um, the, yeah, I think let's leave them there. The, the, there. There are a few questions that are quite tricky and, and quite long and, and difficult to answer in this format. If, you, if you'd like, you could send those questions to support at michaelsons.com and we can have a look at them there and try and answer. But really, you know, some of the questions that are being asked are, are answered in the program. And that's exactly what we've tried to do is to empower you through the program with that knowledge. So if you've got a lot of questions, I would really encourage you to join our program and you'll find answers there in a, in a format that's very easy to consume. Watching some videos, navigating and finding the, the material you want, which will answer your questions. So that's actually the best way I think of getting the rest of the questions answered. So I think I'd like to just thank Mark very much for your contribution. Thanks very much for, for joining the webinars and, and as always your insightful comments. And Nathan, thank you very much for, for coordinating and, um, and looking at those, the, the questions and, and uh, facilitating there. And really thank you to those of you who are still here. I'm amazed at how many people are still here. Um, yeah, I really hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we've, we've enjoyed doing it and I hope you found a lot of value and I really hope that you'll join the program and, and uh, that we'll spend more time together through that or that you'll consult with us and we can help you as a specialist. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thanks everyone.